Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. A nostalgic look back at our favorite Rangers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm Tom Brown, along with my co-host, Rob Berger. We can be heard on Google Play, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and of course, our website at GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson.com. That's GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. Please check it out. You can capture all of our episodes on our webpage. You can contact us by just clicking on the contact bar. You can leave a message. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear about the players that you would like for us to profile. Love to hear about maybe some of the seasons other than the 60s, 70s, and 80s that really made an impact on you as a fan. Again, we will be going off the menu every once in a while. We'll be talking about the current day New York Rangers, the state of the franchise. And again, we love to talk about previous playoff games, impactful trades that took place in New York Rangers history. So wherever you listen to us, please hit subscribe. It's free. So without further ado, here are your hosts, Tom Browning and Rob Berger. Welcome to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. I'm Tom Browning, along with my great friend and co-host Rob Berger. And joining us again is my son, Mike Browning. Mike, again, has uh, been a podcaster talking Sharks hockey uh, out in the West Coast. And Mike joins us again today. But I'd like to talk uh, about today, gentlemen, is our featured Rangers player from the 1980s. And that's uh, Tomas Sandstrom number 28. But before we get into uh, the Sandstrom story, let's just kick around what's been going the Rangers and the National Hockey League. And I guess similar to the last couple of shows that we've had, there's not, not a lot to talk about. They haven't made a lot of headway, but there was news coming out today uh, regarding the Rangers and their positioning for the, the most recent playoff format. And that is that they would be involved with this new format, I guess they would be the 11th seeded team and they would be facing off against the Carolina Hurricanes in the first round. Uh, Rob, why don't we go with you first? What are your thoughts on that or anything else newsworthy around the NHL? I think Carolina is a really tough draw. I mean, the only, the good news is, well, maybe not for their players, is they are very unhealthy right now. Uh, they're missing a lot of guys. So how they bounce back, how anybody bounces back, but they don't have a full roster going into this to this playoff matchup with the Rangers. Of all the strange things in the world right now, I can't believe we're talking about a Rangers playoff matchup. <laughs> yeah, I know. Very true. Is Kreider healthy? Is he? Would he be able to play if they – well, I guess we're talking July, right? So I guess he would be ready to go in July. Yeah, I think he would be. How about – you mentioned the health of other clubs. I would guess by July – Anyone that's been injured, other than you know being out with a major, major traumatic injury like an ACL, I guess they would be ready to go. I guess the health of most teams with a two-week training camp should be pretty good to go, right? I don't know about I th- you know about Hamilton because Hamilton broke his leg. Yeah. Uh, you know I don't know when when Vatnin's expected back. I don't know, and then and then Reimer as well, and then Morazic is dealing with concussions. Yeah. You know, so they, so they never give a they never give a ton of info on concussions. Uh, so hopefully, you know, you never want anybody out hurt. So hopefully, there would be a better series if they were back, if they were if they had a full squad. Sure, Mike. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a good point on the on the Kreider thing. He could be a, a huge difference maker, especially um, in a twenty four team playoff format at the neutral locations. No stand, no no fans in the stands. You know, anything can happen. I think um, the twenty four uh, the twenty four team play playoff format is a little bit uh strange i think that to to put my tinfoil hat on i think it might have something to do with some of the big market teams being on the cusp and uh, them expanding a little bit just to get them to make sure they're in yeah uh, the rangers being one of them um but yeah i mean anything can happen i think uh the rangers uh have a much better shot of winning a stanley cup this year if, uh, you know playing in this format in uh against kind of playing in the what would be if they snuck into the regular playoffs if this whole thing didn't happen so it would be fun to watch. I just think it would be very strange. Uh, uh, I, I, I have this vision in my head of Henrik Lundqvist accepting the cup and street clothes in front of, <laughs> in, front of a, in front of an arena with no fans in it. And it's just – it would just be so fitting for uh, the way that, that uh, the Henrik Lundqvist situation has been playing out. So, um, yeah, it will be interesting. Uh, it will be interesting to see. 
I don't think Henrik Lundqvist would even be suited up. He'll be a healthy scratch. I don't think he was. He, yeah, gonna... that's what I said. He'll, he'll be accepting the, the Stanley Cup in street clothes. Oh, and, that's uh, right. That's right. Well, no, he's not the captain, right? It would be. Um, well, yeah, right. He would have a captain. He's he's the captain. He would accept the cup if it. I, I mean, who else? I it would just it would be very strange to see. Um, again, that kind of Olympic Village format where there's they're playing in neutral sites, and I, I said this last time. I don't know if how I would feel about the Rangers winning that, uh, that type of, of, of tournament. It wouldn't really feel like uh, the real Stanley cup, but um, you know, whatever, cross that bridge when we come, when we come to it. Mike, you and I love the Rangers, no doubt, but I don't think we have to worry about them winning the Stanley cup. I think, I think... hockey is a bizarre sport where well, there's a lot uh, the, the, the front runner going into the playoffs rarely wins anyway. So uh, adding all these variables into this thing, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And the Rangers were playing really well before the before the season stopped. They were really clicking. Yeah, you know they they've been getting in, insane good insanely good goaltending. They were their power play was one of the best in the league. You know they had two, one if not two of the top lines in all of hockey clicking. So uh, and they'll and they'll have Kreider back. Um, so you never know if their defense kind of tightens up a little bit, and and they stay disciplined, you, they can beat anybody. Yeah. Well, uh, Rob, about the neutral site, I'm not so sure that neutral site is really where what they're looking at now, if it's going to be played in July. I think uh, Cuomo and de Blasio are now going to be opening up the arenas uh, locally for all the sports clubs here. So I'm not so sure that teams will be playing at neutral sites. I think uh, teams will probably be playing their home games in their respective arenas, unless the state's decide to come in and shut it down at a later date or if there's a, an issue with um, uh, more cases, uh, more patients get, becoming ill and then having to revert back to another lockdown. Is that your understanding or? No, was, I mean, I think a lot of it depends on Canada too and air and air travel. Um, if, the, you know, if Trudeau opens the borders, I, I, you know, that would be the biggest. Who, I, you know, I think we're, I think we can't, we don't know yet, but it looks like there, this isn't neutral site because, you know, earlier in the week they were talking about eight or nine sites. The, you know, these these owners are are too greedy <laughs> to to not have a home playoff date. Yeah, even though there wouldn't be any fans in the seats, maybe they still want it. Yeah, they want it. They want people in their hometown. They want jersey sales. Right. Yeah. Just the buzz. Just the buzz of having a game at home. Yeah. Yeah. I think it makes sense. And my, and Mike, I mean, I don't think it's really foil hat that you're talking about you know i think the league has been pretty honest that they're losing so much revenue and you need to get montreal chicago and new york in the playoffs and you know i don't yeah. i think if you really push them on it they, they would admit it there's nhl needs it more than any other sport they need to have someone like that yeah i think it's uh i think it's a great point i think some of the big market teams are definitely um you know it's a priority for the national hockey league right like what you guys said you know as far as getting recouping some of the revenue and some of the uh, panache and uh, that type of thing. And, uh, you know, like the Rangers and the Canadians. Well, how about the, uh, all of a sudden, Carey Price has become a story, huh? I mean, um, there are teams that uh, just don't want to play him, even though his playoff record isn't the greatest. I know um, there was some concern about how certain teams would be seated and they would have to play uh, Carey Price. I guess some of the better teams are a little um, – upset that they may have to face price early in the playoffs and they're a little bit um you know anxious about that i don't know if you guys saw that article uh um, yeah that's out there a lot that's um remember when people thought he was better than lundquist yeah <laughs> ah. <laughs> i don't even think those two guys are even in the same uh league with some other guys but um i don't know i think price is he's an outstanding goalie outstanding regular season goalie i don't know about his playoff record but you know, I mean, this is a guy who had who staked his reputation on maybe two seasons of good hockey, and he's been average to, to below average the rest of his career. And as as we all know, and this is something that's happened in the '60s, '70s, '80s. It, for some reason, guys in Montreal are they're awfully overrated. Um, you know, especially since they stopped winning Stanley Cups in the early '90s. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think teams should be should be very concerned about. Uh, about Terry Price. I think they should be a little bit more concerned about Igor Shosturkin, to be honest with you. I hope so. I hope so. But uh, but actually, uh, I mean, if you look at, I think the story with Price, and, and, and if people aren't talking about it now, they will be in the next couple of years, is his contract is 
probably not only the worst in hockey, but one of the worst in all of sports, because I think he just began a 10 year, $10 million contract this year at age 31 or so. And he's already, his, his performance has already started to fall off a cliff. And in hockey with a tight salary cap, especially with a, a salary cap that's at best not going to go up and at worst going to go down with the COVID-19 situation, it is going to be an albatross of all albatrosses. And uh, when it's your goalie, it's even worse, as as uh, people in San Jose know with the uh, with Martin Jones. Yeah, so that's going to be a, a ten and a half story million. Forward. Ten and a half million to 2026. <laughs> Disgusting. And uh, well, speaking of goalies, actually, if we're talking about what's going on in sports now, I, I saw I saw an article uh, getting around to the Bay Area t- that uh, Georgiev is very much on their radar, on the Sharks' radar, and uh, Sharks fans are starting to build a little bit of a. Uh, of momentum around wanting to bring him in. So uh, that could be an interesting uh, thing to watch in the off season this year. Well, I could see why they would be very eager. I mean, there was talk, you know, quiet talk about Lundqvist being uh, a target of the Sharks for a while. Also that Doug Wilson would have loved to have been able to work out a deal for Lundqvist. And I would not doubt that they would love to have Georgia, but that would be, unless the Rangers could get a ransom, that would be a foolish move by the Rangers. And when you have two, if you could have two solid goalies, I mean, let's face it, as I hope Shesterkin is everything that he they say he is, but he's played a handful of NHL games. What happens if he bombs out and flames out and then he moves Shesterkin and we have a 38-year-old has been, you know, back in goal for the Rangers? I mean, you talk about setting back a franchise. I think uh, that would be a foolish move by the Rangers, but... Hey, if they can get a couple of first-round picks, if they can get a bevy, a treasure trove, why not? I mean, nobody should be um, off limits, right? So, you know. I doubt I doubt it'll be a, a several first-round picks, but uh, no. you know, this is this is a team that the, they're talking about a second rounder. This is a team that just traded a third-line center for a first rounder, though, to uh, Tampa. So maybe uh, Jeff Gordon could use that in, in negotiations and be like, hey. You just got a first round pick for your third line center. This is going to be your number one goalie. Let's see what uh, what what can you uh, how deep in your pockets can you dig. So if they can get a first rounder for Georgia, that would be uh, I think that'd be a no brainer to do that. Um, so yeah. hopefully that happens. Well, I kind of hope it doesn't because I like him. Rob, anything else? Uh, how about you know one guy that has gone really under the radar this year? How about Elaine Vino, the job that he did with the Flyers this year? Absolutely, absolutely with. Uh... And with the issues that they have, an interesting story in that is always with the Flyers, but Carter Hart being able to win him on the road and not being consistent. That team, is, who's lined up to play them? I guess it would be the Islanders are lined up to play them? No, they have a first-round bye, the Flyers, the Bruins. But if they can win, if they win. If oh. they win, I think, the, I think the Islanders would get them. Um, I don't know, I could be wrong. But, yeah, the Flyers become a tough team, tough, a tough matchup in the playoffs all of a sudden for everybody. Yeah, I mean – Mike, you and I liked uh, Elaine Vigneault. I mean, I was a little bit ambivalent when they let him go. I mean, I didn't understand why they would let him go like that. I mean, I don't think it was his fault. You know, the Rangers put out a press release saying that they were going to rebuild. I mean, I I don't think he had to justify during that last press conference, you know, reasons to save his job. I think his his body of work, I think, uh, demonstrated that he's a good coach. You know, he's he's done it now with three clubs. Um very underrated coach, I think. Very underrated. Well, he's got he's a he's got a shelf life, and he is a very kind of his skill set as a coach is very specific. He's not really a motivator. He's not really a a mentor to young players. Um, I think one of the big issues that Rangers fans with him, had with him was that he um, kind of relied on veterans too much at the expense of what they thought was uh, the um, the kind of what's the word I'm looking for <laughs> the progress of young players. Yeah, development, um, development, development. So. Yeah, so uh, I think that's that's the issue they had there. And when uh, when the rebuild was announced, there wasn't a coach who was who was less suited for for that. So uh, yeah, I think um, a win now team with some veterans with a lot of skill that's the type the type of coach that you look for um, when you have that uh, you know when you have that type of team. So yeah, he, he definitely was a good fit with uh, with Philly. I think a lot of people thought that even before he started. And uh, what you're seeing is uh, is that kind of come to fruition. Yeah. Well, he had the Sundin uh, twins in Vancouver, but I don't think he had a team as loaded talent-wise like uh, like the Flyers. I mean, this is the first time he's had a team 
from top to bottom that was really very skilled, very loaded as far as talent. And youth, too. They've, they've got a pretty young team as well. All right, so why don't we get into our featured uh, player today. Uh, number 28, Tomas Sandstrom. He was a uh, 36th selection by the Rangers in the 1982 draft. And I got to tell you, uh, a power forward one of uh, the favorites of Ranger fans for the six years he played with the Rangers. But, uh, you know, looking back at the Rangers over the decade of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, I can't think of one player, Robin Mike, that got physically manhandled and punished like Tomas Sandstrom. I, I never saw a guy that was just so physically abused by the opposing clubs you know, whether it be the, especially the Flyers. But there were, I mean, all sorts of, the Edmonton Oilers, teams took liberties on this guy. I mean, he was a rough, tough player, kind of a, I guess, the Darius Kasparaitis, but as a forward, you know. He was a little sneaky with the stick. I guess uh, he played very aggressive. He was a, he was, he played very hard. He did not shy away from the contact, but I never saw a guy that really took it physically like he did and very very seldom did any of his teammates ever go to bat for him I mean the Rangers were never built that way they didn't have a club that came to the aid of their teammates and this guy really took a beating Uh, what are your thoughts we'll start with you Rob what are your thoughts about um, Tomas Sandstrom uh, and his play with the New York Rangers it's interesting that he gets categorized as a power forward uh, because when you think power forward I don't think you know he had the size, but he doesn't have the skill set that I, I when I think of power forward. When I think, uh, especially with the Rangers. Yeah. I mean, other because because he he didn't have that toughness that you'd want to see, especially in the '80s, grinding and you know grinding and you know like you said, I mean, so many so many memories of him getting pushed around, um, especially by the Flyers. Yeah, but he was. I I wouldn't say he he didn't shy away from contact though he just couldn't defend himself he was not a fighter could never fight he would always turtle whenever uh, whenever there was about about to happen you know if he could he would just turtle he was just he stayed away from that but he did do a lot of dirty work down low he did not shy away from that's true that's true you know he didn't shy away from playing down low the crease he did go into the corners to get the puck. He just didn't have the ability to defend himself. And unfortunately, he played for a club, you know, emblematic of the New York Rangers for most of their <laughs> history, it seems. They, they just didn't have guys that would come to his aid. I think that changed a little bit when he went to the Kings. I think he had some of his uh, – he had some really outstanding years with Gretzky and with Tony Granato. But with the Rangers, he just didn't – I mean, I think, I think Barry Beck, when he was healthy, would, uh, would come to his uh, – you know, defense, maybe for Tia once in a while if, if, if Nikki dressed up for the game. But I don't know. Uh, Dave Brown obviously just did a number on him, um, as did um, uh, the guy who played for the Rangers, the, the power forward for Anderson. Glenn Anderson, uh, I think, broke his cheekbone. But this guy had concussions. He had uh, broken legs. He had broken wrists. Uh, I mean, he just took a, a merciless beating. But the guy was a very skilled hockey player. I mean, he scored uh, close to 200 goals with the Rangers in the six years he was there. He was uh, made the all-rookie team in 1985, was part of that Ranger ride in 1986 to the semifinals, or well, the conference finals, I guess. Uh, Mike, what are your thoughts uh, based on uh, – I know you didn't see him play, but based on your research. It seems like he's kind of like an instigator-type type player who – Got under their, got under the uh, the opponent's skin, but wasn't wasn't protected by some of the rules that they have now back then, like the instigator penalty. Uh, so he would he would do some some something whether on purpose or in it's just in a style and his tenacious style of play to get under his opponent's skin, and they would go after him, and uh, and then you know uh, that's where he kind of sustained all those injuries in his career. I mean the guy, I mean the guy racked up over a thousand penalty minutes in his career, so yeah. it's not like he was the, the cleanest guy. Um, but, uh, you know, it does seem like, you know, he's, uh, again, kind of more of a, a modern player that just happened to be in the wrong era. Because, um, like, when they did trade him to L.A., I mean, you just plugged him right on, right into uh, into their first line. They're, they're very finesse first line with Gretzky and Granato. And they just, you know, they, they went, they rode it all the way to a Stanley Cup final. So, yeah, um, you know, that it, it's it, it does seem like he was kind of just a victim of, 
of the the era he was in, and uh, that's probably why the Rangers uh, traded him in the first place. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I was there in LA. I, I was there for all of the LA years. I remember when you know. I remember that trade. It was the trade deadline, in 1990. Um, actually, the Kings gave up my favorite King, Bernie Nichols. Yeah. Um, who I will argue is, should should be a Hall of Famer, and I'll I'll fight that one forever. But that's, I guess that's not for today. <laughs> um, yeah, you know exactly. He when he came to LA, he was he just became the guy. Um, and, and Gretzky liked having tough wingers, so. You know, he was definitely, you know, had the advantage of having guys like McSorley behind him. Um, but, yeah, he, he became, a, he was a 40-goal scorer in L.A., top top winger for the Cup team two years later for a division winner. They won the division in the second year. So, yeah, he, he was a great fit in L.A. Yeah, I mean, when the Rangers, you know, I was, that's another trade when you look back at it. I mean, the Rangers were not shy about getting rid of very talented guys for, you know, I wouldn't say Bernie Nichols was marginal, not at all, but he was really on the downside of his career. I think he scored 25 goals in a year and a half with the Rangers. But to give up Sandstrom and also Granado, those are two huge, talented guys. I mean, Sandstrom scored 29 goals his rookie year with the Rangers. Again, he made the all-rookie team. 25 his second year, 40 his third year, 28-32. And then he had, he had 19 goals with the Rangers in 48 games when they traded him to the Kings along with Granado for Bernie Nichols. So, I don't know, I just didn't get that trade. I just didn't get it. I uh, didn't understand it. It's horrible. It's, um, it's, it's something that the Rangers have had. Uh, they've gotten away from it uh, the last few years, luckily. But it's something that plagued the Rangers for, for a couple of decades where they were just so seduced by toughness and – uh, what what they thought it meant to be a good hockey player that that had nothing to do with skill, and they would make trades like this. I mean, look at look at all the best Rangers draft picks. I mean, there's so many guys just traded in their prime for aging guys or guys that uh, they they felt were were, were going to add some kind of uh, element to their lineup that they didn't have, some kind of immeasurable, some kind of intangible. Yeah. Um. And and he was one of them. And you know I. You know, Sancho could could have been one of those guys where you said, you know, what what if the Rangers never traded him? How many more cups would they have won in the '90s? But you have to remember who they ended up trading Bernie Nichols for. So I don't know if you could actually say that. Yeah, that's true. Mark Messier. I mean, we didn't see the Bernie shuffle too too often in New York, <laughs> and I wouldn't categorize him, Rob, as a real tough, hard nosed hockey player. I mean, he was a flamboyant player, charismatic, but I don't think you know he was a tough player. I think. You know, I, I don't know what they were looking at when you had a bona fide 40 goal scorer on the Rangers and you got a young, a young uh, hot shot in Tony Granado. I, I just didn't get it. I, it's such a, but then again, you know, you, whether it be Red Berenson or Ricky Middleton or the Rattel and Park, I mean, it's, they're littered, you know, Doug Wait getting rid of Dougie Wait. Yeah. Speaking of, speaking of Rangers, second rounders, <laughs> Doug Wait. He was a he was another. Uh, I mean, Doug Wait and Tom and Tomas Sandstrom were probably the two the best second rounders the Rangers have had, and they traded them both. Yeah. For for old guys, and it was probably. I mean, I know that. Uh, I know that Bernie Nichols wasn't tough guy, but it was probably some kind some kind of like a leadership related move, some kind of bogus narrative that they uh, that they used to justify the trade. Well, also, it made no let's sense. Not, let's not forget Bernie Nichols was one of the best goal scorers in the eighties. Oh, he was. He was forty goals two seasons, thirty goals three for four seasons, seventy goals in Gretzky's oh, first right. year. I mean, this isn't like. I mean, he was. In a, he had a great run. Um, you know, his hockey slowed down in the early nineties. So did he. I mean, he still scored. You know, he only scored twenty five goals his first year with the Rangers. But yeah, I mean, it wasn't I, like they were getting a, a slouch at the time. He was. I mean, he was an all star. Oh, absolutely. But it, it just you, when you think of. And and I guess it's like I'm looking at hockey through a modern lens, where you you know you have all these things to consider. You have you know all these expansion teams. You have t- you have over 30 teams in a league. You have the salary cap. It's like teams just don't trade good players anymore. But it just seemed like back in the day, they would get rid of these young up and coming guys in in their in or approaching their prime so frivolously. You know, not just the Rangers, but just everybody. And uh, and I, I guess it's because there were fewer teams in the league, so they figured they could restock their shelves quicker. They didn't have the, the, the salary to consider. The guys were making less money, so the, the trades didn't have as much gravity to them. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, it's amazing how the, the Rangers would just trade all these guys so frivolously throughout this, the 80s and 90s. Um, that ended up being, you know, having, you know, 
Hall of Famer, borderline Hall of Fame careers, Sandstrom being one of them. So yeah, looking at that, doing some research for this for this podcast, looking at that trade, it's just mind boggling. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was – I think Phil Esposito I think was a GM at that time, and I think he's the one that I think pulled the trigger on that. I'm not quite sure. I think it was uh, Espo that was the GM. Um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, – it's just uh, – you know, <laughs> you know, and then he went on and had a good year with Pittsburgh after his stint with L.A. was over, right? He went on and scored 35 goals with the Penguins. I think it was his second year. Uh, yeah. In, 50, in 58 games, he scored 35 goals, and then, you know – he had half a season with Detroit, and he wound up assisting on McDonnell Cup winning goals. So he did win a cup playing half yep. a season with the uh, with the Red Wings. So he did win he did win the Chalice is uh, uh, with the, with the Red Wings. I think in L.A. Rob, I think uh, he's been recognized. I think they had a night for him, right? Did they retire his number, or did they just have a night for him? They just had a night for him. I see. Yeah, listen, ESPN just did their top their top lines for every team the last I think it was the last thirty years. And the top line for the Kings was that Gretzky Sandstrom Granado line. Yeah, yeah, that's an outstanding line. I mean, that's uh, that was the team that went to uh, play the uh, Canadians for the final, right? Montreal. That's right. A few, a few years later, um, yeah. And at the time in LA, that you know Gretzky's first year in LA, that team did not had no defense, right. uh, especially from their forwards. So that was the idea that Sandstrom and Granado were going to help with defense because uh, Nichols was never accused, and nor Luke Robitaille of. <laughs> of back checking yeah that much easy for me to say and you know on a podcast but that was what they were they those were offensive wingers so in center and you know nichols played center too but um so that was the idea when they bruce mcnall said you know him and rogie rogie bashan was the gm that it was all about bringing defense yeah 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 that's uh that's very true the kings had an exciting team back then boy they were high flying and uh they were a fun team to watch you know uh, if it wasn't for that uh, that stick with McSorley, who knows? Maybe they would. They, maybe they win the cup that year. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Wasn't McSorley whose stick they measured? Yes, it was the McSorley stick they measured. Thank you. In game two. Yeah, I thought I'd bring that up. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> so yeah, he went on played for Detroit for a little bit. Won this career up, I guess, with the Ducks. And I guess he's a fireman right right, right now. I guess he's a fireman in Sweden. Makes sense. You got to be a. You got to be tough to be a fireman. Yeah, you know. I guess uh, he didn't like to fight, but he was tough because no one took a beating. Let me see here. Looking back at it, some of his injuries. He, um, Glenn Anderson, with uh, when he was with Edmonton, broke his broke Sandstrom's cheekbone. Another oiler, Craig Muni, caused a fractured leg for Sandstrom in the 1991 uh, Smythe Division Finals. Doug Gilmore, of course, slashed and fractured yeah. Sandstrom's forearm in November 1992. And then, of course, the shot. Did you guys? I remember watching it live when um, they first. The first one happened in Philadelphia, where he just about decapitated uh, Sandstrom in front of the net. And then the last, the second time it happened, and I think I think Brown got a five game suspension the first time. And then the second time it happened at the Garden, and he just about killed him then too. And I think he got I think a twelve game suspension. Uh, have you seen that on YouTube, guys? Going back and looking at that tape. <laughs> yeah, some, I've seen that. That one's good. The Stevens one is good. Sandstrom had some rough rows. <laughs> there's some guys. There's some guys who played back in the late '80s and early '90s who really should be in jail right now. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. I mean, yeah. Scott Stevens is is why I cringe when people say there used to be a code in the NHL and guys to you know regulate the eyes and things like that. That's crap. Because Stevens would would cheap shot and then hop off the ice and he, yeah sure he fought but he didn't fight a lot and he didn't call the bell if he had to and there were a lot of guys like that you know we like to glamorize sure you had the big fighters of the seventies and eighties from Williams through Probert and Coaster and things like that but there were so many cheap shots back then yep. not even close nothing like now now there's one cheap shot and everybody's cries oh this. It wasn't like that back then. It was like that almost every night back then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. And, and, and fighting is one thing. Dropping the gloves and going toe-to-toe is one thing. But the cheap shots, I mean, Scott Stevens is lucky, is very lucky that he did not kill Paul Correa. And, yeah. uh, you know, and um, and Correa <laughs> got right back in the game, unbelievably. I don't know how, I don't know, that guy's, that guy's brain must have just been on Mars during the rest of the game. But uh, And he doesn't remember it. He doesn't remember it either. Yeah, he must. It's scary. I, 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 it doesn't shock me at all. I mean, I don't know how he could. I don't know how he got back in there. But um, yeah, yeah. 
and 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 Sandstrom kind of it's amazing how many times he uh he, he was on the you know he got the brunt end of those types of hits in his career and uh just kept at it uh and uh, kind of ironic that one of them was uh from Glenn Anderson I would say that him and Glenn Anderson were like two ships passing in the night because they switched teams, but yeah, uh, they, 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 they more like they collided in the night, but um, yeah, it's a kind of a little, that's a funny little uh, quirk of the, of the 1994 Rangers team is the fact that uh, <laughs> Anderson and uh, Sancho were both on the team. Anderson ended up being on the cup team and ended up almost, almost killing uh, Sancho at one point. Yeah. Well, that's funny. That's one of the reasons why uh, Neil Smith supposedly at the behest of, uh, Mike Keenan, that's why they got Glenn Anderson. They thought he would be better suited for the rough and tumble play of the playoffs. Um, yeah. I forget who they traded for Glenn Anderson. Do you guys remember off the top of your head who it was? I think, think Abonte was one of them. Tony Amonte, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's another yeah, one, Monty. right? <laughs> another, another one. Another great player that the Rangers uh, got. Yeah, I think you're right, Mike. I think you're right. It was, uh, I think it was Tony Amonte for, uh, for Glenn Anderson. I mean – you know, Ulf Nielsen and Anders Hedberg took a beating when they played for the Rangers, but nothing, nothing compares to uh, to Sandstrom. But the guy could play. Well, if, yeah, and uh, you know, Neil Smith kind of did salvage that uh, that Bernie Nichols situation by trading him for Messier. Yeah. Um, you know, so so that was, I mean, obviously Messier was one of the best, if not the best Ranger of all time, uh, forward at least. So. Uh, um, that that trade was, was I mean he was the, the he was the, the the pivotal player on that 1994 team so kind of despite all the, uh, the the trades that we like to uh, complain about and you know that may that we may view as unnecessary like the uh, like the Glenn Anderson trade and and uh, and those things the um, the, the Glenn, yeah, Glenn trade Anderson, was great the Glenn Anderson Glenn Anderson was the Gardner trade. Right. Oh yeah, that's right. How do we forget that? We just had to show you, right, boy? boy. Yeah, Amante was the was the Noonan Matos trade. That's right. He went to Chicago. That's right. Amante for Noonan. And and that's Mateau. even worse because Noonan and Mateau were just kind of like third liners. Yeah. Well, again, that was the whole idea. Keenan liked guys who, uh, you know, he he played tough defense with the Flyers. You know, he coached tough defense with the Flyers, and he felt that uh, the only way the Rangers could advance was to getting a. Uh, grinding players, defensive-minded players like Noonan and Mateau. I mean, it did pay off, right? I mean, they did win a Stanley Cup with those two guys. and Yeah, but did they – I mean, Mateau scored the big goal, but did they need those guys, you know? But if they didn't make yeah. that trade, I mean, what would what would have been the trade-off between um, finding kind of third-line grinders somewhere else and then, you know, keeping guys like, you know, Amante on the team and providing that, that kind of secondary scoring? Yeah. Would they even have gone seven games, you know – with, with the Devils, or would they have won in, in five or six, you know? Well, that's the bar stool argument that Ranger fans have today. You know, what would have happened if they kept Gartner, Amante, and kept Sandstrom, and kept um, Granado? Would they have been perennial cup contenders as opposed to having the mercenary team they had in 94 that was one and done, basically, right? Could they have been a team that would, would have been contending every year for a decade and that's the I think art. everyone knows the I think everyone knows the answer to that. I think the answer is yes. I mean look at look at the Edmonton Oilers. I mean no one talks about their third liners. You know, they they won all those cups because of who they had in their top 6 and the, it seems like the only franchise that was enamored with other teams role players and brought them in at the expense of their young and promising, you know, top 6 guys with the Rangers. Yep. So uh I think the answer is is categorically yes. The, the Rangers probably would have won more Stanley Cups if they didn't bring those guys in. Yeah, Rob, I think it was, uh, like Mike says, I think uh, the instant gratification has uh, been first and uh, front and center with Madison Square Garden over the several decades, I think, was the reason for them making a lot of these moves. You know, they, they felt well, they were sold on being one or two players away and that they could win and at the expense of their future. And I think uh, it just took on so much momentum that uh, they, could, they couldn't shake it. You know, this now I think is the first time in probably 30 or 40 years since the late 60s with the young Rangers like Park and uh, Kachuk and uh, all those guys, now they're building. But for the longest time, you know, 94 being the one-off, they, uh, they, they gave it all up, you know, in the hopes of going deep in the playoffs. You know, if you look back at the last 30 years, I can't think of too many teams that won the Cup without being terrible. 
uh, that going through a period of being down. I mean, I guess maybe Boston was never that horrible. They, they did miss the playoffs, but they were never, you know, at the bottom. But they were pretty low because they had, you know, they had the sure. Thornton pick. They had the Thornton pick. And um, but just think, you know, the last decade with Chicago and Pittsburgh, even Pittsburgh in the 90s, they were terrible in the 80s. Yeah. You know, that's how they got all those picks. And, you know, the Rangers have, you know, it's, these are great points. Bringing in guys, bringing in Kevin Stevens, bringing in Luke Robitaille. When Robitaille was the body, you know, right. Robitaille was a healthy scratch in New York. Yep. Uh, before he went to Detroit and back to LA. Yeah. So bringing in these guys, you, you know, even you can even speak recently, you know, you, you know how, you know, I guess Shanahan had, Shanahan had one good season, but it was, a, you know, he was at what, 37 when they brought him in here? Yeah. 38, you know, it's the yep. same thing over and over again. Like, you know, the Dolans just want those two home playoff games to get all of that revenue. Sure. Marcel Dion, Kevin Shattenkirk. I mean, the list yeah, goes on. Yeah. Kenny Hodge, you know, the list goes on and on, right? Yeah, so it's, you know, I've been screaming that since this offseason. That this, the Rangers need to be bad. This team that's doing the similar thing as the Rangers has been the Flames. That the Flames have just been never horrible, but never good. And they just hang out in mediocrity. And that's yeah. where the Rangers are. You know, since 2015, really, the year after, they just haven't, they've never excited anybody that this, this is a team that can win. So, you know, I don't know what the point is. No, you're right. Excuse me, but you said it right. I think it was three or four shows ago. You said the Rangers haven't stunk enough to really build a contending team. They just haven't, or, you know, they just haven't stunk enough. And, you know, it's a, it's always a tough sell. Like my, you know, I've got family members who uh, all they want to do is make the playoffs. They think anything can happen. I think that's a myth. It's a fallacy in this league to go through the grind of three or four playoff rounds Usually, the good teams, the better teams, if not the best team, but the the better teams will win the Stanley Cup. Just It's a myth. It's a fallacy that just getting into the playoffs, you can win a cup. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. You know, if, if it's not the best team, it's the second or third best team in the league that will win the cup. But it's not the – usually it's not the eighth or ninth best team that wins the cup. So I think we're all in agreement on that. Any closing comments on, uh, on Sandstrom? Anything else that uh, we should highlight before we uh, end the show? Oh, I was just going to say, um, I think it's a, he's a good player to to, to cover because, um, you know, highlighting the, the trade, his trade uh, away from the Rangers uh, is one of the – probably one of the worst trades the Rangers have ever made that not enough people talk about. You know, he's, again, probably one of the best Rangers draft picks of all time, certainly one of the best second rounders um, that they've ever had. And he's, he's, he's a player who, uh, you know, almost – I think he had like almost over 800 career points. So um, uh, highlighting him as, as one of the forgotten guys is uh, I, I think, uh, I think the Ranger Rangers fans owe it to him. So I'm glad that we, uh, we got to highlight him today. Yeah, I agree, Mike. Uh, it's a, it's a wonder that he has been, been back at the garden for a reunion of some sort, at least the, not, not that I'm aware. Uh, you know, how many 40 goal scorers have the Rangers had in their history, right? I mean, and a 32, 29 goals and a 32 goal season, you know, a very, very important part of their teams. Um, Rob, what are your thoughts? Any closing comments? Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. Um, this has never been a team that is known for scoring a lot of goals with the exception of the goal game line. This isn't, you know, a high scoring team. So we should recognize these guys, you know, since then, you know, how many outside of, you know, I guess early, you know, the, that mercenary team, I guess the couple of years of Yager and Gabrick. Right. Not a lot of big goal scorers in New York Ranger history. So it'd be nice to talk more about guys like Sandstrom. Very true. All right, guys. Well, it was well, a good Especially sh- homegrown guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's for sure. Uh, let's hope that the Rangers keep some of these young homegrown players that they're drafting now. I hope that uh, Gordon Quinn have the patience to and the guard and the garden ownership i hope that they have the patience to nurture these guys develop these guys in the hopes that we can look at the rangers and see that they're a perennial contender that they're one of the elite teams elite organizations for once in the national hockey league that would be a pleasant uh, pleasant change all right guys well thanks again for a great show i really appreciate it fans if you have any uh, suggestions or requests, please uh, let us know on the website. Uh, on behalf of Rob Berger and my son, Mike Browning, this is Tom Browning saying so long for the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for listening. This has been a Go Tommy Boy production. 